right, so we are live, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're joining from. And my name is Jesse. I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And if you're joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. I want to say a huge thank you again to all our teachers for joining live, YouTube, Facebook, wherever you're tuning in from. We know it's a crazy start to the school year, and we really appreciate you spending some of your time with us as you continue to highlight amazing people and places. I think we've done 60 broadcasts since school started up, uh, so it's really exciting and nice to have a lot of repeat teachers here as well. So. I mean, you guys know who, who we're joined by today. All of you are super excited. We've almost seldom had more excitement for a program than this. Uh, Emily Calandrelli is joining us. I'm going to bring her in. Before we uh, dive in with her talk, I'm just going to do my like, wax mystical interview. So we've previously maybe introduced her as, you know, the next Bill Nye, the next David Attenborough. And now what we're going to have to start doing is saying to everyone else, they're the next Emily Calandrelli because... Whether it's TikTok or Exploration Outer Space or Ellen's Wonder Lab, the amazing Netflix show that a lot of you guys know and have, have tuned into over the last few uh, weeks, um, she has done so much. Basically, every time there's a, a niche to fill in science communication, Emily is right there doing some of the best top-notch stuff in the entire world. It's always a thrill to have her. And so today, she's going to walk us through an experiment, tell us a little bit of a cool story, and I can't wait. And I hope you guys are as excited as I am. So Emily, thank you so much for coming in today and take us away. Jesse, that is the best introduction ever. Thank you so much. And also, I love your Corona beard. I noticed that there's a little bit more uh, hair in this area. Anytime. <laughs> My Looks girlfriend is here. <laughs> uh, man, so thank you all for joining. I'm so excited to be with you all here today. As Jesse said, my name is Emily Kellandrelli. On the internet, I am often known as the Space Gal. That's where I am on social media, the Space Gal. And that's because I studied a lot of aerospace engineering before I got into science television. So I studied mechanical and aerospace engineering for five years, and then I went to MIT for graduate school, and then I studied more aerospace engineering. And then after school, I got called from a production company that asked me if I wanted to be the host of a new space show. And I thought that sounded like such a fun adventure, and I said yes. And that show is called Exploration Outer Space, it's Saturday mornings on Fox, and we've been doing it for seven years now. So you may know me from that show. Uh, it's a very, very fun show that's all about space exploration. I go to different uh, private companies and universities and schools, and I talk to people all about space. We talk about rockets and spaceships and rovers on Mars and searching for aliens and everything in between, and it is it's such a dream job of mine. For someone who loves space quite a bit, I it's just, it's so much fun, I can't tell you. I've had so many adventures through that show. Um, but today, I have a new show that I am so excited about on Netflix called Emily's Wonder Lab. And Emily's Wonder Lab is just, uh, it's, it's my favorite project I've ever, ever worked on, my, my favorite show I've ever worked on. And in each episode, each ep there's 10 episodes in the first season, and each episode we do one larger than life science experiment. So I'm not sure how many of you here have watched it yet, but think like a pool filled with slime, an entire pool filled with slime, where the kids get to make the slime them, themselves. We talk about what slime is, we talk about the polymers and slime, and then we get to swim in the, in the slime. So you make the slime, you learn about the slime, and then you swim in the slime. And then at the end of each episode, at the very end, there's an at-home experiment. So for all of you watching the show at home, this is your opportunity to bring the science of Emily's Wonder Lab into your own kitchen, into your own backyard, into your living rooms sometimes. It's a way to get very messy in the name of science. And so every episode has one of those, and I think it's really, really fun. At the end of this, I'm actually gonna do one of the experiments from Emily's Wonder Lab for you here. Um, it involves fire and hopefully not a fire alarm going off in my house. We, it, 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 we'll just have to wait and see. There is always that possibility. Science is filled with unexpected adventures and we may have one today. So stay tuned for that one at the end. Um, but I'm really, really excited about that, Joe, and I'm happy to take any questions about that one. 
Another thing that I do um, is I write children's books. So I have a book series called The Ada Lace Adventures. Ada is this third grader who loves science and technology just like me. And she goes on adventures to solve mysteries with technology and gadgets that she builds herself. And it is just, it's such a fun, fun series, if, especially if you love science and adventure like I do. And the fun part about that book series is the third book in the series, Ada Lace, Take Me to Your Leader, I actually sent to space. So I think it was, let's see, a little over a year ago, I put that book on a rocket and that rocket went to the International Space Station, which is the orbiting habitat around the Earth that's moving at 17,500 miles per hour where astronauts live and work consistently for months at a time. It's this wonderful, wonderful thing. And my book got to go there. And it was through this program called the Story Time from Space Program. So if you're ever looking for a really cool read aloud, the Story Time um, from Space Program has a number of books that they've sent to the International Space Station where they've had astronauts, real astronauts, read the books out loud on video. So just imagine this, there's an astronaut floating in the space station and they're reading a book to you and the earth is in the background. You can see through the window that the earth is in the background. I mean, I can't think of a cooler read aloud. And for, for me to have something that I wrote fly to the International Space Station, be read by an astronaut, be read by an astronaut who's floating with the Earth in the background, like that is pretty cool. That was a dream come true. So you can find that at storytimefromspace.com, the Ada Lace uh, read aloud there, which is really fun. Um, but I wanna tell you a little bit about how I became interested in all of this stuff, right? Did I, was I one of those kids that always imagined that I wanted to become an engineer when I grew up? Did I want to talk about science to kids on Netflix. I mean, that no, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I was a kid. I didn't know any scientists or engineers. So no, I didn't I didn't know that I wanted to be an engineer when I grew up. I just I didn't know any engineers. I didn't know what they were like. I didn't know that career at all. But what I did know is that I liked math and I liked art. And I just really love those two parts of me, that creative side and that sciency analytical side. And I always really enjoyed combining both of those skills to do certain things. Um, and so when I was in school, when I was deciding what I wanted to do, I remember walking down the halls of my, of my uh, university at West Virginia University. And at West Virginia University, I saw a poster of a student, it, they, they looked really young and they were floating and it said on the poster like, do your homework weightless. And I was like, what does that mean? And I looked into it and it turns out that it was a class that you could take if you studied aerospace engineering where you would design a really cool science experiment with your friends. And if your science experiment was good enough, you could fly on something called the Vomit Comet. Now, I don't know how many of you have heard of the Vomit Comet, but the Vomit Comet is the reason that I decided to study aerospace engineering. This was the reason that I fell in love with space and NASA and everything having to do with the cosmos. The Vomit Comet, I'm gonna tell you what it is. It's so, so cool. It's gonna blow your mind if you haven't heard it yet. The Vomit Comet is a plane that flies like an 8,000 foot roller coaster in the sky. So it flies like this. This is what we call parabolic motion. It flies like this. And when it goes over the hump, if you've ever been in a car that's driven really fast over a hump, or if you've been in a roller coaster where you go over a bump really fast, your butt lifts off your seat, and you, you feel like those butterfly feelings in your stomach, and you get a little airtime for just a brief moment. Well, the Vomit Comet gives you that butterfly feeling for 25 straight seconds. So your butt lifts off your seat, you're floating, really you're free falling within the plane, 
for 25 seconds. So you feel like an astronaut for 25 seconds. And then of course you have to go back up and just like a roller coaster, or if you're in a car and you're going up a steep hill and it goes, and you kind of feel like you're being pushed back, back into your seat. You feel like that on the vomit comet, but you feel that really, really fast. So you feel twice your weight. You feel two Gs, two gravitational forces. And so you push back and it feels really, really heavy. All right, so you feel weightless, okay, and heavy, okay, and weightless, and heavy, and weightless, and heavy, and weightless, and heavy, and weightless, and heavy, and weightless, and heavy for an hour and a half, which is why they call it the Vomit Comet. So it's a really, 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 really fun ride. I've never experienced anything more fun in my entire life. When you're on it and you're feeling that 25 seconds of weightlessness, you don't feel like you're floating. You feel like you're flying. And so you can go from one end of the plane to the other just like this. And you feel like you're soaring through the air. And it's like the best feeling in the world. I did um, uh, flips. You can do flips. And oh my gosh, it's so, so much fun. But when you get on the plane, before you experience weightlessness, everybody tells you, they say, you need to take it slow. Your body is not used to this. When astronauts first get uh, into space, they often experience air sickness. Air sickness is kind of like seasickness. They don't have their air legs yet because they haven't felt weightless in a while and their body is confused. Their body doesn't really know how to handle it. And when your body is confused like that, sometimes its natural reaction is to barf because it thinks that maybe you ingested, maybe you, you swallowed something bad for you. Maybe your body has something poisonous in it that's messing up your brain and it wants to get rid of it. So when you get on the vomit comet, they tell you, you're gonna feel a little bit air sick, take it slow so that your body doesn't barf. <laughs> and of course, when I got on for the first time, I was like, this is awesome. My feet were on the ceiling, my head was on the floor, I was doing backflips, I was going from one part of the plane to another, I was just going wild. I loved it so much. But then uh, I felt a little uneasy and I remembered, that when you get on the plane, you're wearing a flight suit. And in that flight suit, you have a pocket right here. And in that pocket, you bring the most important tool that you will bring on that plane. Can you guess what that tool is? Based on everything I've said so far, I have to imagine you have some pretty good guesses. In that pocket, you have a barf bag. Because when you're weightless, and remember, we're on a plane with experiments every which way, on the floor, on the walls, sometimes on the ceiling. There's electronics everywhere. Because of that, you wanna be very, very careful if you get sick. Because if you vomit in weightlessness, where does that throw up go? It goes everywhere, right? So that tool that you bring on that plane is a very, very important tool. You have to get it out. And if you feel sick, you have to barf in the bag and tie it off real quick so it doesn't go anywhere. And then you have to hand it off to one of the people who work there, which is probably not the most fun job in the world, but a very, very important one. Because on this plane, it's not just for fun. The Vomit Comet is absolutely one of the most fun things you can do. But it's a very, very, very important uh, lab. It's a laboratory that's flying in the sky because what we want to do is we want to study different experiments in that weightless environment before we send them to space because anything you send to space is going to be really, really expensive, right? Rockets are pretty expensive. So, so to send an experiment all the way to space that can cost tens of thousands of dollars. A really cheap way to test that experiment in a weightless environment is to, before you put it on the plane, or before you put it on the rocket, test it out in this plane. Instead of tens of thousands of dollars, it's just a few thousand dollars. So you can test it out on the plane, work out all the kinks, make sure you have it working correctly, and then tweak your experiment to be even better and then eventually put it on the rocket. So the Vomit Comet isn't just a fun ride, even though it is, it's not just a fun ride, it's a, this very, very important 
laboratory in the sky. Because if you think about it, everything works differently when you're weightless. Everything from throw up, right? Throw up works differently to food. I've seen people testing out different types of ovens on the vomit comet because when you cook food, it's going to be a little bit different because things are going to float around. Everything's going to act a little differently. Fire acts differently in weightlessness. When we have a flame here on Earth, see how that looks? It's kind of like a teardrop shape, right? Let's see, there's a better way to see it. And it, it, it elongates up like this. And the only reason it does that is because we have gravity. Because hot air, which is less dense than regular air, rises and that convection forces the flame upward. So the only reason a flame looks like this is because we have gravity. If you don't have gravity, when, you, when you're in a weightless environment, what do you think a fireball looks like? What do you think a flame looks like? Well, I kind of gave it away. It looks like a ball. It looks like a sphere. Instead of pushing up because, you know, hot air is lighter than regular air, things that are less dense in uh, weightlessness doesn't really matter. It's not gonna, it's not gonna rise up because you don't have gravity. So instead the flame is gonna go in all different directions and it's gonna look more like a sphere. And fire is really important to understand because if you have a fire in this oxygen rich environment of a space station, it's really dangerous. You wanna make sure you understand exactly how that fire is gonna grow and spread. And so studying fires in a weightless environment is very, very important. Another cool thing I've seen on the Vomit Comet is a treadmill. Because if you're running here on Earth, gravity pushes you back down to the ground. With every step, you're sort of jumping up. Next time you run, think about this. With every step, you're jumping up, but then gravity brings you back down to the ground. So exercising in, in space is really important. If they don't, their bones get really weak, their muscles get really weak. Exercising two hours a day for astronauts is really important so that they can prevent their muscles and bones from getting weak. So how would an astronaut run on the International Space Station? One of the solutions that they found to this is to put bungee cords on their arms. And so instead of having gravity force you back down, it's kind of like a spring or a mechanical way to push you back down. Because if you have a, a bungee cord, when you stretch it, what's it wanna do? It forces it back down, right? It's kind of like a spring that you're stretching and then it wants to go back to where it originally is. So if you have that on your arm, every time you jump, it stretches and it pushes you back down. You jump, it stretches, it pushes you back down. And so that's one of the ways that they've solved that problem, which I think is really clever. That's just a long way of saying the Vomit Comet is one of the coolest things that exists. And that is the reason that I got into um, space exploration and NASA. So I think, I think it might be smart for us to take questions first. And then in the last maybe two or three minutes, I'll do my science experiment just in case my fire alarm goes off and I have to <laughs> dip out. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, the first fire alarm in the history of this program might be kind of fun, not for you. But so anyway, we'll go to the end. Uh, what I'll sure. do really quick is I'm going to change our background here so that everyone can see uh, Emily floating in space. Oh, so there we are on our page and the, on the Vomit Comet. So check that out and you can tell how happy she is. Um, my, my thing before we dive into the questions, if anyone in all our classes can find anything that they're as passionate about as Emily is about everything, you are <laughs> set up the path to a really good career. Um, so let's dive in. We've got a whole bunch of groups joining on YouTube as well. If you're on YouTube and you haven't let me know where you're joining from, please do. I'd love to hear where you are around the world and, and take as many questions as we can. But let's dive in with our live classes. So Miss Green's class, uh, we're going to kick off with you guys in Beaumont, Alberta. So come on up. I know you're a huge fan. So. Very big fan. Hi, Emily. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I'm a distance learning teacher in Beaumont, Alberta, Canada. So this is my online classroom, but all my kids are watching. And they put together some really great questions. Now it's World Space Week, so I've been throwing some space content into our lessons. And three of my kids, Tyler, Caitlin, and Michelle, all wanted to know uh, if you had the opportunity to go to space, would you? Oh, I love this question. So I, for me, I mean, I would absolutely love the experience of going into space. So absolutely one day I do want to. The, my big question is, is it going to be safe enough? 
Because when, if you think about the early planes, when people were first flying planes, those first planes weren't super safe. You kind of had to wait until the industry uh, imposed more regulations and learned what worked and what didn't and how to make it safe for all of us. I mean, there's like a billion flights every year that are safe, right? So it's like, we want, I want rockets to get to that same level of safety uh, before I go to space. So I'm waiting for a little while. Um, I also need somebody maybe to fund my trip in space because at the moment it's like $250,000 to fly into space. And so uh, we're just gonna need someone to fund that adventure. But I would go, I would love to go eventually. I bet someone will fund you to go and we're excited to come bring you in for a broadcast then. So once that happens, we'll, we'll make it happen. Um, Miss Foster's class joining us in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Welcome in guys. And uh, yeah, just demute your mic and you'll be good to go for a question. Did you have any obstacles to overcome being a female scientist? I think being a female scientist does uh, have, it comes with its own obstacles. One of the big things is that when you walk into a room filled with people who don't look like you, um, it feels a little bit unwelcoming. And so a lot of times um, I was very lucky to have a really good guy friends who made me feel welcomed and made me um, like welcomed me to be part of their uh, group projects and stuff. And so as a girl, it's just, I think you can imagine if you walked into a classroom where every single other person in that classroom was a girl and you were the only guy, it would feel a little bit like you were in the wrong place. And so it would be really nice if some of the girls in that classroom were really friendly to you and welcomed you as part of those class projects. And so I think that that's one way that um, we can help girls feel more welcome is to make sure that they feel like they belong. Uh, I've never had anyone use the reverse analogy before, so I really appreciate that you did that. And thank you so much, Emily. Uh, yeah. All right, let's go to Dutton, Ontario, Miss Little's class. Come on in, guys, and uh, go for it. What inspired you to be a scientist? Ooh. Well, what inspired me to be a scientist? So this is a really good question because I think a lot of people who end up in these fields, they knew a lot of scientists and, and engineers growing up and they were like, I wanna be like my aunt or I wanna be like my mom or whatever it is, you know? But for me, um, I was very practical when I was a high school senior and I wanted to get a good job that made good money. And the fun thing about going into science and engineering is that most of those jobs make really good money. And so I, I Googled, I used Google to search all the majors that you could major in in college. And I looked at their starting salaries and engineers made some of the most money. So I was very practical and I was like, I wanna get a good job. And that's how I first decided to go into engineering. Then once I got into it, I learned that engineers can help make the world a better place. They can use science and technology to help people who need it the most. Science and engineering is fun. I got to do all of these adventures, like go on the Vomit Comet, and I got to do internships, paid internships in California and in China, and I got to travel the world doing things like this. Um, and it's just really fun. So uh, those are the reasons that I, I eventually became um, really excited about becoming a scientist or engineer. Fantastic. Uh, all right. I apologize for the phone in the background. Half the fun of live video chats. Um, I'm going to go to Gertson's class in Bueller, Kansas. If you guys have a question for us, come on up. What is the most interesting thing you've ever seen or done at work? Ooh, no pressure. Ooh, I love that question. What's the most interesting thing I've ever seen or done at work? Well, the Vomit Comet is definitely uh, up there. But other than the Vomit Comet, um, a couple years ago, I flew to Russia and I trained like a cosmonaut, which is Russia's name for their astronauts. I trained like a cosmonaut at the Yuri Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center in Russia. Um, that's kind of like their NASA at Russia. And I got to go in something called a human centrifuge. And a human centrifuge is just kind of like this really cool amusement park ride that they use to train their cosmonauts for the G-forces that they experience on a launch into space. And it goes like this. So imagine a human is sitting in my fist and the human centrifuge goes like this. And it does that because the way um, it's called centrifugal force 
and you have this force pushing out on the human and that's sitting in the fist. And the faster this goes, the more G-forces, gravitational forces, they feel on their chest. And so I felt uh, one G-force, two G-forces, three G-forces, four G-forces. And that's kind of like four G-forces would be like if four of me sat on my chest. And so it felt really uncomfortable, but really, really cool. Like you were riding a really, really fast roller coaster ride. And that's the same G-forces that a astronaut or a cosmonaut feels when they're launching on a rocket into space. Um, and so being able to feel a little bit like what it feels like to train like a cosmonaut, that was pretty cool. That is pretty cool. By the way, the first known usage of the phrase, imagine there's a human sitting inside my fist in the history of the Star <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, great questions pouring in on YouTube. We are going to take some in a minute, but hello to Slave Lake, Alberta, Miss Adams class. We've got Miss Murphy's class in Toronto, Miss Young's class in Lindsay. So a nice group of uh, groups and a uh, nice group of groups, nice group of classes. Thanks so much for, for tuning in, guys. All right, let's go to a story in New York for Miss Cump's class. Come on in, guys, and uh, take us away. Hey. Hi, we're big fans. First of all, we want to know if there's going to be a second season. And then this is Emily, and she wants to ask her a question. Awesome. What was it like being nine months pregnant while doing Emily's Wonder Lab? Yeah, good and question. Great question. Yeah. So um, season two, we're still holding hope. We're still waiting. We love it when people like you watch the show. It is so I cannot emphasize how important it is. If you like a show, tell your friends to watch it, too. That's the only way we get a season two. So share it on social media. Share it with your other teacher friends. Share it with your other parents, your other friends, everyone. Just share it with everyone. Um, but being nine months pregnant, filming a show was very interesting. Uh, my husband flew to L.A. with me to make sure that if we had an early arrival of our daughter, he was there to drive us to nearby hospitals. Um, but you know what? I felt pretty good. I didn't know what it would be like to be pregnant. Um, I'd never been pregnant before, and I wasn't sure how hard it would be. But for me, and everybody is different, but for me, um, it was a really fun experience because I had something very exciting going on right here, and I had something exciting going on outside that. I mean, I was filming my own Netflix show. I had all the adrenaline in the world to be able to find the energy to do that because this was such a dream come true for me. Um, I probably took a, a few more naps than I normally would, and I drank a lot more water than I normally would. Um, but it was it was just a really fun time. I was walking like six miles up and until the day I gave labor or I started, I had labor. And so um, I had a lot of energy, um, but yeah, it was kind of a very exciting time for me. Yeah. It's something that I think a, a lot of uh, news about the Emily's Wonder Lab show is harped on. I think if I'm not mistaken, you are the only ever pregnant major host of anything ever in history or, or the man. So kudos to you. And uh, we met your baby on, on our last broadcast. It was so exciting. So. Oh yeah. Uh, Oh my gosh, yeah. she's, she just turned one and just started walking like two weeks ago. So it's a whole new ball game over here. Holy, good luck. Uh, thanks for spending any time with us amidst that. Um, so let's uh, do our one last question from Mr. Buckley's class. See if we can take a second round or whipping through these guys. You guys are awesome. So mm -hmm. Mr. Buckley's class, you typed a great one in the chat bar. I'd love if you'd share it. Uh, it's a grade three fours in Peterborough, Ontario. If you guys want to demute your mic and come on in, you're good to go. All right. Yeah, you're good. Okay. When did you start being able to do Emily's Wonder Lab? Yes. When was I able to do Emily's Wonder Lab? So this was a show that I I wanted to do a children's science show for five years. And I'd been pitching it to different people for five years with one of my producer friends. And we just really believed in a show like this and we wanted it to we wanted to bring it to kids like you because we felt like this was so much fun and it needed to be out there. And so we were very, very thankful that Netflix did it when they said, yes, I was only about five months pregnant. Um, and they said, well, uh, do we want to film this show before or after the baby comes? And they kind of left it up to me. And I was like, well, I've never had a baby before. I hear it's kind of hard. So let's try to film this before the baby comes. And that was, I would say, a little over, because my daughter just turned um, like 13 months. So it was about 
14 months ago, a little over a year ago, that we filmed the show. Um, and what's really wild is that we filmed it before quarantine happened, before coronavirus was here. And so we had no idea what world we'd be living in today, where everybody would have to wear masks and we'd all have to be very careful with germs and uh, learning would be a little bit more challenging. And so what we're hoping is that the science experiments at the end of Emily's Wonder Lab can be really useful to your teachers and to your uh, guardians at home so that we can all play with science with stuff that we have lying around the house. So hopefully it's been really fun for you all. Fantastic. And again, when we're done this broadcast, everyone should just leave and go watch Emily's Wonder Lab on Netflix immediately. Get Netflix if you don't have it. Why not? Yeah. Um, let's go back to Miss Green's class. Um, so if you guys, <laughs> Miss Green, no need to hurry. <laughs> oh, good. Hi. Uh, Hi. I was just texting with my students in our group chat about how much we're enjoying this and how amazing it is. Aww. Um, I actually have a question um, that I wanted to ask. Our school has, uh, and you've talked about this already a little bit, but I, I just want a little more specific. Uh, we have a girls in STEM day that we run here where we take girls from all over the school board and we have a keynote that comes in and they do different activities uh, to sort of kind of inspire or help support our girls in STEM. So what do you think is advice that you would give to a young lady looking to a career in STEM? Mm. I mean, I would just say follow the stuff that you find the most exciting and that interests you the most. Um, things that helped me along the way is developing a lot of strong female friendships that were also in STEM. Um, I think that's been really helpful and finding different organizations that uh, promote science like FIRST Robotics and LEGO Robotics or X Robotics are all really good ones. Um, uh, girls Who Code, Black Girls Who Code, all of these organizations are really, really wonderful. Um, Carly Kloss has a, um, a coding camp as well. There's a lot of things out there that I think are really helpful to kids today. Um, and a lot of these are helpful in finding other girls who are doing the same thing. And I think that friendship, that sort of like fellowship with other women um, who feel a lot of the same things you might feel if you're a little bit different in the world of science can be really helpful as you go through your STEM career. Yeah, you're one of the only people that's ever mentioned friendships as a really integral element, uh, which is really nice. And as far as representation goes, you talked about your own experience and, and not sort of having that that mentor or, or uh, version of you to look up to. So one thing we like to just highlight, again, all our programs go straight to our YouTube channel and about 65% of all the people we bring on the broadcast are women. And in February, of course, we do our entire month dedicated only to women in STEM with 55 plus broadcasts. It's always our most popular month. So if you wanna check out any incredible women uh, from the you know our, our past, you can go on our YouTube channel and check that out. Uh, Dr. Ellen Stofan was on earlier today talking about the ISS that you mentioned too. So some really, really great people in the last little bit and coming Huge. up very that's huge yeah she's yeah. she rocks and we've got uh yeah. three more astronauts coming in the next few days including two women so i i encourage you to check that out as well if you want a nice follow-up wow. to this talk with emily all right uh for our youtube groups the questions that you guys have been asking have been answered or asked by some of our live groups if you want to ask more please do while you're doing that i'll go back to miss foster's class come on up guys do you your mic and uh you're all set um it it if you could choose a, a, one place to do a TV show, where would it be and why? Oh, if I could choose one place, like a yeah. country? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Woohoo, man. I, my dream is to be able to do a TV show about the international space programs because so often we hear about NASA because NASA is really well funded and they do, uh, of course, a lot of the space exploration stuff that makes it top news. But so many countries around the world have their own space programs. And I find that to be incredibly fascinating and wonderful. And I think everybody has their own reasons why they're drawn to space exploration or space-based technology. And so I would love to go to all of the different countries that um, have space programs and highlight the work that people are doing around there. Um, I, in particular, um, I would love to, I mean, this is more just countries that I love to visit, um, Australia and New Zealand and everywhere in Europe, Italy, I think that would be really wonderful. I've, I've visited India in the past to talk about their space program, which is incredible. Um, China has another really great space program, of course, Russia. 
I mean, there's Canada, I've, I've visited Canada a number of times um, to talk about their space efforts. They're one of the leaders in space robotics, um, if not the leader in space robotics robotics. And so there's just so many countries around the world other than the United States who are doing interesting things. And I would love to do a show that highlights all of their work. Yeah. Uh, well, speaking on that note, I have to do a plug right now on channel one uh, for us. We have Taryn Tomlinson. She is an engineer for the Canadian Space Agency. And then on uh, 2.30 p.m. today, she's doing a French broadcast too for any of our bilingual classes. And we're having her back for two more on the ninth as well. So Canadian Space Agency plug of the day. There you go. Cool. It's cool. We've never had we've never had JAXA. I think we've had European Space Agency people, and then we have a whole bunch of amazing NASA engineers. So seriously, Abigail Freeman's coming in tomorrow. She's one of my favorite people we've ever had on. So if you aren't signed up for that yet, check that out, and uh, I'll put it in the banner on the bottom as well. All right, uh, we're whipping through these. We've got about five more minutes. We're going to take questions from everyone, and then we're going to do this cool experiment and set off some fire alarms. Um, so Dutton, Ontario, Miss Little Group, come on back in. Go for it. Was school difficult for you? Oh, if you didn't catch that, Emily, was school, was school difficult for you? Oh, yeah. Um, was school difficult for me? I would say, and this is something that um, I think it's just a different way of thinking about uh, school. Um, for me, I was always a little bit of a slow learner. It would take me maybe like an hour to understand a concept that it would take somebody else a half an hour to really understand it. Um, so for me, when I think of things that are difficult, I think of mostly things that just take more time. And um, I would say that I spent a lot of time studying and I don't think of it as being like difficult per se, but I think of something, it just, it just takes a lot of time to learn and you have to change your mindset a little bit. You have to be able to believe that anything is learnable, that you are capable of learning something. Sometimes we set up our own barriers when we think like, oh, this is going to be way over my head, or I'm not really a math person, or this is just too complicated for me. You learn it. We set up our own barriers and we prevent our own brains from learning something. So the first and foremost thing you have to do is believe that you are capable of learning something and be willing to put in the time to learn it. Because sometimes it just takes us a little bit longer to learn things, but that doesn't mean we can't learn them. And I think what's really fun for me is to understand that you can make yourself smarter with spending that time and spending time with hard topics. You can make yourself smarter, which is really magical. I think that's really cool. Yeah. yeah. It's one of my favorite things we can highlight that a lot of the people that we bring on this broadcast were not geniuses when they were little kids. Uh, it tends to be hard work that leads to a lot of great success and getting to do things that you're really passionate about. So uh, pursue those those dreams and uh, I, I love that. I'm um, gonna take a question from YouTube from Miss Adams class because I know it's one of your favorite questions, Emily, one of your favorite things to talk about. Where do you see the future of space exploration going? Why is this such an exciting time for space exploration? Uh <laughs> I tell people that I think now is the most exciting time in the history of space, um, even more so than the Apollo program, because right now we have more people from more places doing more things in space than we've ever had in history. The cost of rocket launches has been, is lower than it's ever been before. And when you get the cost of something like that down, all of a sudden more people can do it. And now when more people can do it, you have different ideas popping up everywhere of how to explore space and what to do once you're there. So we have people creating space tourism companies. Virgin Galactic has a space plane that goes into space and you can buy a ticket to go into space. People like uh, Katy Perry and uh, Ashton Kutcher and Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt and Justin Bieber have all bought tickets on this space plane. So once they get flying, which will hopefully be in the next few years, Justin Bieber will one day be an astronaut. We will live in a world where Justin Bieber is an astronaut. And I think that is so cool. He will open up the world of space to way more people than just this traditional astronaut. Um, and I think that's really exciting. Maybe he'll make a song in space. Who knows? I think that's cool. Um, there'll be movies in space someday soon. I, Tom Cruise is already in the works. Um, he's in the works of this new movie that will be partly filmed on the International Space Station. Um, space hotels are going to be a thing one day in the future. We're going to have more research done in 
space. We're going to have advances in new types of drugs that will help people here on Earth. We'll learn more about the health of people down here on Earth from studying astronauts and how space changes astronauts' bodies in space. Um, so there's going to be a lot of really exciting things going on in the future. And I'm just, I'm excited that we're living in a time to see it. Yeah, Justin Bieber in the space plane is a great, we should make that a title for one of our broadcasts. Um, this is fantastic stuff, guys. Uh, okay, let's take three more questions and then we'll dive in with that experiment. Uh, just too much enthusiasm to go around. I love it. Um, Ms. Gertzen's class, then I'm going to go to Ms. Kump and Mr. Buckley in that order. So Ms. Gertzen, come on back up, guys. Go for it. Yep, you're good. I think, oh, did it freeze? It froze. Okay, Ms. Gerton, I'll come back to you guys lickety split. We'll go to Ms. Kump's class first. We'll go back to New York. Hey, Ms. Kump. Okay, hi, go ahead. Go ahead. So, um, if you do do a season two of Emily's Wonderland, what experiments might you do? Ooh. What experiments might I do? Is that what he said? Yeah. Yeah. What experiments might I do? Oh, I have so many ideas. I'm telling you, I have an entire document filled with science experiments that I think would be fun for like the next few seasons. Um, man, what are some of the ones that I, I really enjoy? There's, I think like bottle rockets are really fun. We didn't get to do bottle rockets on season one. Um, there's like uh, ferrofluid is something that I find really fascinating. We have, you're mostly used to seeing magnets as solid, like you have magnets on your fridge, for example, but there's liquid magnets called ferrofluid that are fascinating. And you can play with them using other magnets and make them come alive. And I think working with ferrofluids would be really interesting. I think it would be fun to do a birthday themed episode where we do an Emily's Wonder Lab birthday theme episode where there's science experiments related to birthdays. I want to make DIY ice cream. There's You can use science to uh, create ice cream in a bag in five minutes with just salt and ice and then some other ingredients to make the ice cream. I, there's a lot of ideas that I have brewing that I would love, 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 love to do. So we just, we got to get this one too. Season two, go watch the show. In the backdrop, there you go. Go check it out. You'll be that excited as Emily is right above her little screen there. Um, Ms. Gertrude Flash, you guys are back. It's all working. <laughs> uh, go for it. Oh, did it freeze again? Mm. Okay, you typed it in. So, Adelia, here we go. Adelia wonders, how does it feel to be on TV, Emily? Ooh, I love that question. How does it feel to be on TV? It was really weird at first. Um, when I started doing this seven years ago, I didn't have any experience being on TV. And when I go back and watch those early episodes, I feel like, ooh, you look kind of cringy. <laughs> I feel like I wasn't super good at it at first. Um, for me, it's kind of like any other skill set, like maybe practicing dance or practicing a band instrument, where when you first try it out, you're not really good at it. You kind of need to practice. You need training. You need to do it for many hours every week to get better at it. And that was the same thing for me in TV hosting. Um, I, I would watch myself and I would say, oh, I, I do this too much or I do this too much. I need to cut out that. And so I tried. I failed. I iterated, meaning I changed something up and I tried it again. And I just keep kept doing that year after year after year until I got a little bit better at it. Um, the best part about it is when I see people in public who have watched the stuff that I do and I get to talk to people who watch the show because that for me is the absolute best because you don't have, often get to see the people who read your books or watch your TV shows because you're making them in a studio in LA and then you go back home and you don't really get to see the people who watch your show. So when I get to meet people who watch it, uh, that for me is like the most fun. I bet. What a great answer. Um, all right. One more question. Mr. Buckley's class will come back to you guys and then we'll do this awesome science experiment, which I cannot wait for. So Mr. Buckley group, go for it. Yep, you're good. Have you ever had a science experiment that went horribly wrong? It went horribly oh, wrong. I love this. I love, love, love this. Great question. Have I ever had a science experiment go wrong? I mean, I I steer away from anything that would be too dangerous. So I, I don't do anything that I think is going to, like, cause, like, a huge explosion 
explosion. I do small explosions. Um, if you watch me on TikTok, I'm on TikTok. Um, everything that I do on TikTok is family friendly and it's all about science and space and science experiments. Um, so I don't do anything too dangerous because I don't want anybody to try it at home and get hurt. Um, but I do things that, you know, you, you would probably need some uh, parental or uh, adult supervision. Um, but one time when I was doing a live program on a news station, I was making oobleck. And if you have ever watched Emily's Wonder Lab, you know what oobleck is. It's you just mix cornstarch and water and it creates this cool fluid called a non-Newtonian fluid that sometimes acts like a liquid and sometimes acts like a solid. Uh, but I didn't get the measurements right because it was really early in the morning, like 6.30 in the morning, and I only had half a cup, or I had a fourth a cup of water and I needed a half a cup. And I mixed in my cornstarch and then I looked at my water and I was like, oh, this is only half the amount of water that I need, I need more water. And so I mix it in. It wasn't watery enough. It wasn't working. And I was looking around frantically. I was right here sitting in the seat, looking around frantically for more water. And the only thing that I could find was my coffee. And so on a live news broadcast, I grabbed my coffee and threw my coffee in my oobleck, making this very like brown oobleck -y mixture. And surprisingly, it actually worked. It worked pretty well. I was, I felt like I was being a scientist experimenting on the spot and it, it worked pretty well, but oh, that made me realize that when I do things live, I should always have something pre-made just in case the live experiment goes wrong. Kind of like a baking thing where you know how you mix all the things on a baking show but then the baker always has something ready in the oven to bring out and show the people i need to be more like a baker um but that was probably my one instance where something didn't go perfectly well and what an auspicious question uh experiments going really wrong before you're going to dive over an experiment so guys it's been some fantastic questions we've loved all your I I was like, hopefully not this one. Yeah, but we'll find out. So let's dive in. What are you going to show us today? I'm so excited. Okay, let's, I'm going to roll up my scientific sleeves here. So mm. this experiment is all about air pressure. Air pressure is really important, especially when it comes to space exploration. Um, when you think about it, air pressure around us here on Earth, right on sea, like right on the ground at sea level, it's way more powerful than you might think. Air pressure is really, really strong. It's kind of like um, the weight of a milk jug on the tip of your finger. That's how much pressure the air around us is putting on every inch of our bodies, everywhere, all the time. It's kind of like little air fists that are constantly pushing us all the time. And so a lot of people ask, like. If air is that heavy and that strong, why aren't our bodies crushed by it? Well, it's because our bodies are made for this. Not only are our bodies not crushed by it, but we're designed for it. We need it to survive. So when you go into space, you need to bring that air pressure with you. This is one of the main reasons that we have to wear astronaut suits and the vacuum of space. Because with no air, there's no air pressure. There's no little punching on your body. And when you don't have fists punching on your body, all of a sudden the air inside your lungs and the air in other pockets of your body escape. And that's not good for it. We need the air that's inside of our body to stay inside of our body. That's why we need those air fists pushing on us all the time everywhere. So if you go into space without a space suit, the air inside your lungs starts punching out. And with nothing that's punching against it, it starts expanding. And it, as it expands, your lungs burst, they rupture. And that's not good. That's not good. You would not survive that. And so to show you the power of air pressure, I want to do this science experiment. So here I have a boiled egg that's peeled. It doesn't have its uh, peel on it. So it's a boiled peeled egg. And I have just a milk jug bottle here. And the goal of this experiment is to get this egg inside the bottle hopefully without breaking it. And we're gonna do that using the power of air. Cause if I just smushed it in, the egg would just totally break. It just, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work. So what we're going to do is we're gonna get it in with the power of air. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna light this newspaper. This is actually like coupon paper. Um, we're gonna light this on fire 
and I'm gonna stick it inside the bottle. And then I'm gonna put the egg right on, on top. And what that's gonna do is that it's, that's gonna excite all of the air molecules inside of our bottle. They're gonna dance around and some of them are going to escape the bottle. And then once that happens, when I put the egg on top, the fire is gonna go out. Because what's one thing that fire needs? It needs oxygen, right? And without oxygen, the flame's gonna go out. So now, once the flame goes out, we have less air inside of our bottle. And now that the flame's gone out, that air is cooling and condensing, right? Because when you have hot air, it gets bigger. When you have cold air, it condenses. So what we've done after we do that, we've created this kind of vacuum in a bottle, kind of like space where there's less air and it's kind of like a vacuum. And so the air pressure outside is now so much greater than the air pressure inside the bottle, right? The air pressure outside, those fists outside are way stronger and the air fists inside the bottle, they're gonna punch that egg inside. Okay, let's try it. Please fire alarm, don't go off. Please don't burn our house down. We kind of say a good luck charm right before we do our science experiments. Let's see if I can move this camera down so you can have a, there we go. Okay, here we go. I always get a little bit nervous when I do this. Okay. Lots of fire, lots of fire. Woohoo! Okay. Oh, did you see that? That happened so fast. Look at that. Okay. And do you see it? It's like it's completely intact. There's so much smoke. Look at that. And that is how you get an egg in a bottle using the power. Of air. It's the sound of it. That was so great. How? It's so satisfying. It happens so quickly. It's amazing. Okay, now get it out. <laughs> hmm. Okay, so the fun trick here, and I've done this in the past, um, you can use the same scientific principle to get it out as you did to get it in. What you need is a blowtorch. <laughs> <laughs> If you put this on a table, you don't want to hold it because it'll get really hot or you can hold it with special gloves, but it gets really hot. I don't recommend this. Don't try this at home. But we have a blowtorch here. So we have tried this at our home where you get a blowtorch and you heat the bottle. And now all of a sudden the air inside the bottle is getting excited. It's expanding. You're, in you're increasing the pressure inside the bottle. Those air fists are punching the egg out. Um, and so that's one of the ways that you can get the egg out. Just using a blowtorch. Super cool. Emily, what a fun time. Um, for all our kids, you mentioned TikTok. If you want to see more of Emily doing really cool experiments like that, Emily's Wonder Lab on Netflix, TikTok, all our amazing things. You know how to put them up in banners uh, again. So Emily's Wonder Lab, we've got Exploration Outer Space, Ada Lay's Adventures, and the Space Gal on social media. Emily's doing it all. Thank you so, so much for your time. Uh, as always, what a fun session. And thanks, you guys. Thanks for having me. I, I love having you. Like, I love doing this with you. You guys are so great. It's Core by Seed Your Pants is one of my favorite organizations. You guys, like, absolutely kill it all the time. Um, and I am thankful for the work that you do. Well, thank you so much. And uh, what I want to do now is bring in class to say thank you so much because they're the real stars of the show. They're what make this all possible. So, Miss Green, Miss Foster, Miss Little, Miss Gertz, and Miss Cump, come on in and join me. Thank you and goodbye to Emily. And Yay!